And in part, that is exactly what the conference is all about. Because on some levels, um, some see this, this, this transformation of these the citizens as the um, root of sort of this, this forced assimilation at the root of anti-Semitism, while other people see this as a necessary first step towards modernity. I can use to say that. So, in part, this is the result of the fact that the Jew status in French society was always inherently ambiguous. And in the ambiguity, resulting in part from the fact that in some parts of France, not all, but in some parts of France, the biggest part, or the, or the part where the, where it was most populous for the Jews, the Jews occupied a very important part of the economic and societal function, in that they, uh, they provided some credit, etc., that was not available in other ways. But it was pretty animosity, so they were tolerated, but there was also a lot of ambivalence. So it was a very, uh, it, they, had, they had this ambiguous status. But the ambiguity also resulted in part from the fact that the Jews were not a homogenous group. Okay? They were actually very diverse communities, and they, they, which could be broadly identified in two separate groups, the Sporotics and the Ashkenazics. And the Sporotic, and it is the evidence that, of course, the ultimate of this would be the, what would happen as a consequence of this. They would be emancipated as two distinct political groups and in two different degrees. So, the emancipation was neither also, it's also ambiguous because it wasn't nearly as abrupt or as dramatic as it, appear, as it appears. And it's my theory that in fact there was a pre-revolutionary movement. The idea of Jewish reform started before the French Revolution. Now, the thing is about the pre-revolutionary reform is that many people were taking a look at this and it was partially through the filter of the Enlightenment because they thought that Jews were corrupt, that they were a uh, 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 degenerate race, that they were degenerate because they needed to be regenerated. They were living under oppressive circumstances, restrictive oppressive circumstances. And so the idea was that if they were just emancipated, if they were given better conditions, they could become a larger part, they could assimilate into a larger society. So there was that, that's part of the pre-revolutionary movement. And it later combined with the revolutionary movement to become one political movement. But the thing is, these two different movements actually had conflicting aims in the sense of the pre-revolutionary movement, while aiming towards a form of assimilation, still required a certain amount of And the other didn't. They wanted complete conformity. So having said that, matrimonial customs, particularly divorce law, are often the historical symbols of national identity. And this is particularly true for the Jews. And with the idea of Jewish regeneration, this idea of Jewish reform, there was a simultaneous movement, almost, almost identically at the same time, for a revision of the uh, which coincided with the Enlightenment. And it was the, the move of secularity towards a new idea of divorce. Previously, divorce had been uh, it considered a sacrament and therefore indissoluble according to the ecclesiastical law. But this Enlightenment idea saw um, marriage as an outgrowth of natural law and therefore a dissolved law. So this was sort of happening simultaneously with the idea of Jewish regeneration. And what happened was, sorry, my glasses, what happened was, that um, Jewish divorces, which were appealed outside the Jewish community, often became a forum for this, for this uh, reordering of structural relations between the state and the community. And this would accelerate with the revolution. Sorry, I just want to put, put this, this out to you, but I should talk about it before. This is actually just to show you the animosity, the sort of the ambiguity of Jewish status in French society. This is actually uh, two icons taken from the Strasbourg, uh, the cathedral at Strasbourg in France. And the one on the left is the, the symbol of Christianity. Upright woman, crowned, very tall, wearing a, having a straight staff, right? And she's like, obviously a symbol of, of what was right and good and authority in the world. The symbol on the left is Judaism. Blindfolded to the truth, drags, right, with the broken staff, and the, the word of Judaism, the Talmud is being held down. So just uh, to uh, show you a little bit of what. And there was, of course, massacres in Strasbourg. But they eventually, uh, in Strasbourg, they never came back to life. So, <clears throat> having said that, um, the Jewish divorces, the thing about the Jewish divorces, I'm going to talk about two particular cases, one more of Lady and the other in the case of Samuel Piotto. And what these, as I said, these became forums for the discussion of Jewish divorce, was, uh, for the discussion of Jewish uh, civil status. And they encapsulated the anomaly of Jews in France living according to their own particular personal laws. Um, 
and which uh, and sort of raised the issue of whether Jewish divorces were under the uh, jurisdiction of the rabbis, local councils, or the crown. And it was conflated with the issue of whether the French body could rule on an issue of personal status at the marriage and divorce, um, which was fundamentally repugnant to it, and whether Jewish customs should be accorded some kind of legal recognition. So this sort of became a conflated, a double-faceted issue of Jewish civil status and the secularizing of divorce. And divorce, which had heretofore been sort of considered this repugnant practice of a barely tolerated alien minority, um, became an element of Jewish assimilation which probably couldn't occur unless there was some kind of reform in Jewish customs. Now I have to talk a little bit about the history of because it's quite important in this understanding, I guess, right, as I argue. Um, the historiography of Jews in France, first of all, has given a lot of attention to the tension between sort of the modern hegemonic right to be different and um, the assertion that the secular hom homogeneity replaced the character but not the spirit of religion in French society requiring conformity. So there's what it is essentially it's bifurcated over the right to be different, the issue of the right to be different in Paul Hanman's And in part, so there's really two groups of, of, of historians on Jews and the French Revolution. The first group is informed by, largely informed by the work of a man named Francois Ferré, who's a very famous French revisionist historian. And Ferré's idea was, he talked about the, like, the competition of discourses as the origin of the French Revolution, but he thought that there was this idea of democratic absolutism, and that according to him, the discourse of national sovereignty which was embraced in 1789 was incompatible with the guaranteed, uh, right, the guaranteed rights for the individual that's inherent in the right of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And he, he thought that it was less a charter of liberty than a blueprint for oppression. And it, that it, it leads to the conclusion that intolerance to difference, um, sorry, intolerance to difference proves to be the revolution's major shortcoming. And that becoming a citizen meant losing of corporate identity, losing your corporate self, and uh, sort of assuming a national identity as opposed to a corporate one. So although Ferre's, the full development of Ferre's theory sort of antedated some of the other Jewish historians, it certainly informed this one group of, of, of uh, historians. And it predominates with the idea that the erosion of corporate identity is necessary to assimilation. And it gets some support from the idea that the Jews were a specific and identifiable collectivity that was sort of indigestible in a larger uh, French collectivity, in the French, the universalism of the French Empire and Republic. Um, and it also, it gets some support for that, in the fact that the Jews, although they were a very economically insignificant, sorry, a very numerically insignificant number in their society, something like 0.5% of the general population, and although they really didn't have that much economic significance, again, a very insignificant and there's actually a, an historian named Robert Schechter who's done a lot of research on this. They received a disproportionate amount of attention in their engineering grant. They were mentioned way more times than the Protestants, even though they're a much more smaller group. So in some ways, they became the litmus test for the possibilities of emancipation. Um, and so the followers of Beret sort of see this, uh, see this dissolution of corporate identity as this forced assimilation. And at its extreme roots, it became, if you look at it in its most extreme form, you see it as the root of modern anti-Semitism. And this is still thought of emerged with Robert and Shell in his uh, reversion, a revision of, of the idea of Napoleon as repressive rather than a liberator. It's been it's been echoed by people like Simon Schwartz books. And um, it most resonates most particularly with um, Arthur Hertzberg in his ideas of the Enlightenment as the root of modern anti-Semitism. Um, and although, um, and it also most recently uh, has, though there are some, some even more current historians who have been sort of molded by this like, post Holocaust frame, which is certainly what it draws on. People like Jules Rodano, who have called the uh, Jewish Revolution in France the hostages of the universal. And um, Patrick Gerard, who purportedly was inspired to write a book about the revolution um, after uh, a visit to Auschwitz. So the reverse of that school of thought is um, that those people who, like Robert Baventer, do not view assimilation 
the majority of French Jews as reality. And what they see is the revolution was progressive. They uh, were very critical of using a 20th century lens, and they, they don't see that the Jews, the Jews wishing to enter the public life, were really faced in France with this idea of assimilation in the sense of no longer needing to identify as a Jew. Unlike Austria and Germany, where the conversion really was the ticket to public life, it wasn't like that in France. They also see the erosion of communal authority as a much more gradual process, which will go with some of the cases that I'm going to talk about, where they, there were cases appealed outside beyond the community. And, um, and also, they don't condemn the Jewish youth, the internal internalization of uh, uh, sort of a new secular learning. They see that the privileging of Western culture um, was a way of trying over, over and above the traditional Jewish learning as a way of integrating. So, and they get some support from the fact that they do account for um, regional differences, as well as they help with the fact that you cannot see Jewish history simply as a catalog of catastrophes, pogroms, and massacres. You can't, they, 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 um, they do not, this group of historians does not want to look at them, use that lens to sort of connect things that may, be, may not have an intrinsic connection and also to uh, not to exclude other factors that may develop. So having said that now, <laughs> to turn very quickly, there, as I said, the Jewish community in France was actually can be categorized into two distinct categories, although there were large, there were lots of communities, but the first one was the Sparatists. They lived in the south of France, I'm sorry to speak so quickly. They lived in the southwest of France. They came largely as crypto Jews. I don't want to use them around because I was told today about the derogatory term it is. Um, and fleeing the Inquisition. They were given letters patent. They largely lived in the letters patents were quite broad. They were a small community. They lived, they were quite um, culturally assimilated. They spoke French, they were largely bourgeois, so more prosperous, and they were tightly controlled by their communal organization, but largely by lay people. Converse of the Ashkenazics, who were impoverished, they lived mostly in the north, uh, northeast and had been acquired by um, territorial acquisition, largely the Treaty of Westphalia. And they were basically in They lived in very small communal, uh, communal villages, although there were some larger centers like Mass and largely communal villages. They were very impoverished. They uh, large scale, but there were some of people. They were totally communally insulated, they, and culturally insulated. They um, were very distinctive. They did not largely speak French, mostly Yiddish, and um, they had terrible relationships with surrounding community, a lot of animosity. And they um, also uh, uh, were largely controlled by the rabbinical leaders as opposed to lay leaders. One thing communities had in common was that they both had this idea of communal control. Um, and although it sometimes was uh, used as sort of a ping pong ball between the parlement and the, and the king. And when that happened, there was a challenge to Jewish jurisdictional authority. And this was sort of reinforced by these appeals outside of the community. So jurisdiction over Jewish divorces by both ecclesiastical and secular courts became sort of this platform for the articulation of a new concept of Jewish status. And as I said, it was simultaneous with this attack on divorce, which finally culminated during the revolution in a larger attack that was sort of part of a larger attack on the Roman Catholic Church. So words like divorce became the same as democratic and citoyen in the revolutionary lexicon. Um, Jews had always committed to divorce on certain conditions, provided that complied with certain uh, rabbinical requirements, like formalities. But the fact that they had sort of raised this issue in French society, what should a divorce, which is valid according to all rabbinical requirements, be recognized in France, despite the conflict with ecclesiastical law? To do so would mean allowing Jews to have the right to be different. So there was, prior to the 18th century, there was uh, the issue of divorce most often came up for people when someone in the Jewish community married someone outside of the Jewish community. Typically, a woman married a man, the man abandoned her, and then it was a question of whether she wanted to remarry in the Jewish community, whether she would be allowed to do so. That was typically uh, invalidated the first marriage to allow her basically to remarry within the community. However, the convert outside of Judaism who wanted to remarry a Christian based on different dilemma, and that was that his Jewish wife probably wouldn't, uh, could not be forced to accept the divorce. And on the other hand, the Christian authorities wouldn't recognize the divorce because of the indissolubility of marriage. That is precisely the dilemma that hit that a man named Borak Levy, who was a national Nazi Jew, who wanted to convert outside of the community, convert and marry a Christian girl. And when the Abbe refused to marry to be the bands, he appealed all through several, not only the Jewish king, but 
several Latin medals of ecclesiastical and secular glory. And what happened, although we lost, was a very important ruling. And the ruling was that Jewish divorces would be treated, Jewish marriages would be, would be recognized, would be treated the same as French divorces. And um, to do so, what they did was they basically said that, uh, that Jews are entitled in that regard to the same uh, protection as other French Jewish women would be, their marriage was, would be recognized. So, having said that, that the, the law, the, the, the law of our lady, was um, mentioned officially in the letters patent in 1784 and impacted subsequent uh, canon law, and it pro basically prohibited converted Jews from remarrying unless they were widowers. This was the exact opposite result that happened from the, in the Piotr Piotr case. Samuel Piotr was a um, a uh, Bordelais Jew, a Sparatic Jew from the Corporate who married a uh, Jewish woman, uh, another Sparatic Jew, in London. And after several, I think I used to practice matrimonial law, I always laugh about this. After several years and um, several children, he decided that the marriage was invalid. Um, and he, to do that, one of the claims he made was that he relied on French law, that he had complied with French law, so the marriage was never invalid. And again, the two cu couple appealed to various levels of courts. This case had basically been considered, it's almost like a cause to live. Like one of the things you read about in Hebrew magazine, very scandalous, but it was raised above that level because it attracted the attention of many important jurists. And they wrote about it and, and in parallel with the, the idea of uh, uh, the divorce. And it was part of this large pro divorce movement, the largest pro divorce movement prior to the revolution. In the first instance, what they found was you know, the Jewish custom of divorce is odious, the Jews are barbaric. And the Jews, they should never be allowed. That was one element of thought. The second element of thought was that the, that the Jewish custom of divorce is very odious, but the Jews are tolerated foreigners, they should be entitled to live according to their own law, and we must recognize this practice no matter how odious it is. But the third line of thought, which was, it was really actually um, penned by people that later became important revolutionaries, like Arjay and Lapidel, was if that divorce is an element of natural law, and the Jews are the French, and that was the line of thought that would resonate with many people down the road. Having said that, okay, so after the Piotr case, uh, the wife died, by the way, so that's one way to end the case. After, after the Piotr case, um, there was uh, uh, a man named Malazur, sorry, that's his name, a man named Malazur, who was a very important performer who had been appointed to do a commission on the Jew, on the Protestants, the king, the king Louis XVI appointed him to do a similar one on the Jews. And he consulted with all these people who had written a memorandum about Kyoto, and, and, and it was, it was, the work is amazing. But he, Malazur had this idea, he had really adopted the idea of the regeneration of the Jews, and he wanted them to dissolve their community uh, connections, and to do so he wanted them to publicly register all their civil, their personal status, marriage, the birth of children, etc. He didn't mention the divorce though. But um, Malzer's uh, work, and by the way, it would influence the Abbe Gregor, who was a great advocate of Jewish rights and actually led to the emancipation of the Jews. Malzer's works were never, or recommendations were never enforced because he was uh, the revolution intervened and also because of the difference between the Sporotics and the Ashkenazics. They were very much at odds about how to, about being connected in any way, any kind of umbrella. So in their own way, they were their own, they, they uh, prevented the establishment of some of these changes. So during the revolution, um, and after the, finally, when they both were the emancipated after the, the National Assembly decrees, the, the price of the emancipation was the dissolution of communal authority and the harmonizing of Jewish law with French law. And, um, but one, one of the problems was that they didn't mention divorce. And so when uh, revolutionary tribunals went to listen to, or went to hear divorce cases, what would happen would be that they would have to rely on old Jewish law to decide the cases. So it's sort of by, by this judicial void, they tended to perpetuate this past particularism, which they didn't want to do. Of course, this was totally unsatisfactory to Napoleon who wanted a um, harmonized Jewish law. Not to say there's a group of historians who think that Napoleon really wanted to uh, provoke the emancipation decrees, and he did some things to the Jewish community that was not so nice. But um, what, he, what he did do was he organized what he called in, in the Assembly of Notables, and subsequently a body called the Grand Center Dream. And they were to answer 12 questions to harmonize Jewish law. And the second question on the list was the issue of divorce. 
And what they did, what the Jews did, what the, what the notables did to answer this was they um, allowed for the, uh, sorry, they, they, they said that, that no Jewish divorce could be granted until a civil divorce had previously been given. Evidence of a civil divorce had, had to be given. And um, this was a way, of course, there's no minimum precedent for this, but this was certainly a way to satisfy that they had this great desire to retain their emancipation. And so that's they so they were trying to conform to the law to do that. So in conclusion, I know I'm already a couple minutes over, so I'm trying to hurry. Let me just say, Jewish divorces appealed to French courts reveal a transformation in attitudes towards Jewish civil status, which predates the revolution. The questions raised by the divorce cases define issues related to fundamental societal values and the basis of the civil status of the minority. The idea of the Jew assimilated into French society grew out of the interplay between tolerance for Jews as foreigners, a required conformity to overriding theological law, and a growing secularity, including the recognition of a new moral order based on natural law. Despite differences between the Slavic and Ashkenazic communities, divorce provided a platform for the construction of Jewish identity as French citizens both within the community and the French society generally. <coughs> the exact parameters of this new identity have never been definitively established left unresolved and problematic legacy which continues to reflect its contentious origins of time, I only can say the rights of air, etc., etc. However, the further study of pre-revolutionary Jewish divorce and the intimate perspective it provides can only assist us in resolving this dilemma. That's it. <laughs>
from where they religiously came from. Today, in this talk, the well-known slogan used by Heinrich Treitschke, the anti-Semite who kicked off the Berliner antisemitismus strike, will serve as an example of what national identification has to do with modern antisemitism. The stress will be on the fourth word of his outcry, the Jews are our misfortune. Looking at antisemitic statements, one quickly senses that they reflect not so much the direct link of an individual uh, feeling an immediate personal threat or harm from a certain Jew. This is obviously not the idea of most anti-Semites. Rather, they refer to the collective, to the threat to us, and thereby they refer to a collective identity. This is, it is the we, the anti-Semites claim, the Jews threaten. The we is not a random group. It's the anti-Semites' own national, uh, own nation made up of all its citizens. Given this rather extensive we as a somewhat natural starting point for any standard modern anti-Semitic uh, statement, what then, what then seems to be at stake for the anti-Semite? What does he claim is being ruined when this group, the we, is harmed or is being harmed? We have all heard and known the accusations and slurs related to the financial, political, and cultural sphere. Thomas Howey sums it up well. Whatever the Jews do endangers the national well-being. According to some anti-Semites, the Jews have pulled the US into a war in Iraq. They also seem to be influencing the government with their monetary and power interests, and therefore the government decides for in favor of this tax law or a better advantage for the wealthy. Or it is the media that only report what is approved from a so-called Jewish lobby, according to anti-Semites. The implicit idea is that if it were not for the Jews, the country would be much better off, the economy would work as it should, and politicians would do their job, that is to serve the country instead of serving a certain lobby. So we see the primary content of the accusations uh, of the modern anti-Semite, and this content is quite severe. Granted, other nations and their citizens are characterized as having similarly evil interests too, and it is even seen and accepted that they would harm the interests of other nations in order to serve their own purpose. Still, when there is no time for, following those interests is usually seen as each person's due. This is something Klaus Holz, uh, in his investigation, uh, called, uh, in his book called National Antisemitism, stresses um, exactly there. Before going in any further to see how all this relates to the Jews in the anti Semites view, we should pay close attention to Holt's analysis. He takes for granted that all citizens go with their nation and respect the right of um, other nation subjects. The whole question of why people uh, identify with the nation in the first place is not taken into account. This might seem like a digression, but I will try to show, show how national identification is a prerequisite and part of modern antisemitism. Also how people understand themselves as subjects, citizens of a state and of a nation, is central to the theory of antisemitism. All of it is important in order to analyze the correspondence as well as the contradictions of the anti-Semitic worldview and reality. Back to the anti-Semitic point of view on other nations. It is indeed different when it comes not to just any nation, but to the Jews. The anti-Semite's perspective is that the Jews control his homeland, be it so the homeland of the anti-Semite, be it in the US, Argentina, Germany, or any other country. The reason for that is not because the Jews follow their national agenda as everyone else, but because they follow their own special Jewish agenda. The content of that special agenda, and some explain, consists of materialism exclusively. Jews are all about money, about getting the best deal, about getting even richer. That's what they strive for. Uh, to clarify with any other nation, the nation is about the nation. Anything else is supporting it. Such subordination does not apply to the Jews. Their highest goal in the anti-Semitic view, of course, is money, money, and money. 
often though, for anti-Semites, the relation from Jews to the nation is seen exactly the other way around. In this view, money appears as the means to the real aim, world domination. To prevent any confusion, let me mention that this just shows how contradictory any ideology might be. Can be. Either way of those two alternatives, um, there are two characteristics ascribed to the Jews by the anti semite The first of these is that Jews are responsible for an abstract and general national misfortune. And Jews also serve as a reverse image of the anti semites own idealized nation. The image various anti semites have um, of their own countries differs from country to country, of course, Many varied national myths are uh, bound around the globe. But the image of the Jew is astonishingly persistent and global. It functions as a universal counter image representing greed, power mongering, and willful ignorance um, about any other need. To explain the third function of anti Semitism, we should consider one more aspect of national identification. It is that we that includes the claim of an identity. In fact, the claim of two identities. The first is identity among the members of each nation. The second identity is the one between the citizen and the state. It is assumed a general ident identity of each member who expresses his nationality by way of being and behaving. And it works the other way around. The state counts as the representative of the nation and therefore manifests and fosters the national spirit. Both identities are merely claimed. They're kind of an ideal that can never be reached because the identity at best is partial. There's not a single thing that all members of a nation agree on, whether it is the political route to take or whether fried chicken is more American than pancakes. <laughs> Neither is there an identity of state and citizen. I will discuss the reasons in detail later. For the moment, it is suffice to say that the state cannot, cannot satisfy the varied needs of um, every citizen. This means that reality does not provide the material to confirm this basic modern identity. I mentioned that one aspect of nationhood because of the gap between the citizen's expectation of identity and the non-existence of this identity in reality. This gap needs to be bridged in any national identity. This aspect is important for the study of modern anti-Semitism, as anti-Semitism is one way of filling that gap. It is an attempt to fix the inconsistency, but the attempt is still tainted with contradictions. Anti-Semitism is a possibility to bridge that gap because something is declared not being part of the national identity, i.e. the Jews, and that offers everyone who is part of the identity a way of distinction. And it represents a distinction to the outside that amounts to the strengthening of the inner bond, bond among the members. This, of course, is the case with any sort of racism and towards local foreigners. No matter where they live, they are all members of other nations and are perceived as such. But looking at the difference between racism and anti-Semitism here, one discovers another interesting and very specific aspect of Jew hatred. Sure enough, Jews within a nation are declared not to really belong to that nation. But nor are they necessarily representatives of another nation. They can be seen, even after the foundation of Israel, as the so-called third other. To refer to Klaus Holtz, they don't only not really belong to a certain nation. In fact, by some anti-Semites, they are seen as not belonging to any nation. This fact becomes obvious when looking at Jews who carry a certain passport, for instance, a German passport, the anti-Semitic mind has no secure way of knowing whether these Jews are really part of the German nation. Thanks to the materialist characteristics attributed to them, they are always perceived as disloyal and thereby not really part of that nation in their hearts. Any other nation goes on the same level of identity. The anti-Semite has his national identity, and other nations' members have theirs. But the Jew fulfills yet another function. He's not only a counter-image to each nation, uh, but he stands for mediating the national principle as such. In the anti-Semitic view, 
the Jews can have the role of an A or anti nation. In a world structured by nation states, this verdict actually means danger. Negating this principle is a very principle of exclusion. It means that Jews do not belong nowhere. This negation is an explanation for the imminent sense of anti Semitism, but still, it is only part of the explanation. The, the exact content still remains to be analyzed in the context of other aspects of modern society. Is there any judgment hidden in the anti Semitic perspective that sees the Jewish communal spirit in materialism? On the other hand, there lies this idea or promise of unity in the concept of national identity. The German poet Friedrich Schiller put it in a nutshell We shall all be, uh, no, we shall be a single people of brethren. At the same time, modern society is built on the principle of competition. In politics and economics, in every social aspect, people compete with each other. In such a society, there needs to be an instance that sets the rules about how to compete and to prosecute those who do not comply. For everyone who takes part in the competition, this instance now becomes something that everyone depends on. Therefore, everyone has to want those rules and has to develop an interest in the entity doing its job as a referee or a judge. To want the setting of the whole game also means that everyone has to want the restrictions implied in those rules, also when they apply to oneself. Here, we encounter an interesting contradiction. To want somebody to take care of the ground rules for the competition means to step back and to not only have an interest in one's own position, but also in the competition as a whole. Immanuel Kant and Georg Hegel both talk about this fundamental conflict for any citizen in the modern world. The later became known as the bourgeois, i.e. the self-interest on the one hand, and the citoyen, or the interest in the common good, on the other hand. It is mentioned here because, interestingly enough, only the bourgeois side of the argument is attributed to the Jews. The anti-Semitic claim that the Jews only follow their own interest and their will to get more money and power drives them, translates exactly into representing the bourgeois quality. Knowing that a normal citizen has the awareness of both citoyen and bourgeois, this is a phenomenon. Even if one group were to be extremely successful in following one of those two paths, why would there be hate for it rather than congratulated for achieving success in that area? Obviously, something about the bourgeois attitude is not appreciated. That was in the conservative debate in Europe in the 19th century, and that is where racial anti-Semitism developed, the idea that acting rampantly as a bourgeois would harm national well-being. The Syrian angle, I suggest, represents an effort citizens must make for their nation in the name of modern society. It demands of them to give something up instead of following the comfortable way and just worrying about themselves regardless of the societal consequences. That might, might seem fairly straightforward, but it does not explain why the entire bourgeois attitude is projected onto a group imagined to be evil and to bring evil. In the anti-Semitic view, the bourgeois is either seen as okay as long as people stick to the rules when pursuing their own self-interest, or, in its radicalized form, the citoyen is the good and the bourgeois is the bad. This obviously clashes with the reality where everyone has to be a bourgeois, at least in some aspects, and most people accept the citoyen's point of view as a well. Even more, the accusation that the Jew would act as a pure bourgeois and thereby endanger and corrupt the nation derives from the Sutrina angle. That is why, according to the anti Semite, not only himself or any other individual is damaged, but society as a whole. This again suggests that the anti Semite speaks from the viewpoint of the nation and he thereby abstracts from himself. In his claim, he negates his own interests and negates his being as a bourgeois too. The open question here remains why this bourgeois side is negated and projected onto an perceived outside group. First, Detlef Clausen and more recently Klaus Holz uncover the ideal of the nation which is behind the anti Semitic accusation. 
in the imagined Gemeinschaft, which one can roughly translate into community, which becomes the benchmark of the anti science critique, the individual exists as a part of the community, and he exists, it exists to serve this community. Unity is the first principle, and the individual must support it. Also, anti science assume this imagined community as having existed previously. They that project their idea of society as historical and thereby stress their moral right to reintroduce uh, the structure. So here again, we see the contradiction between the anti-Semitic ideology. The Jewish sense of belonging is portrayed in two ways. Anti-Semites either think that the Jews invented liberal society with its necessary clashes of interest because it is their idea of society and because it is their way of behaving. It's all about arguing that no sense of togetherness exists whatsoever. But many other anti-Semites, on the other hand, believe that liberal society is only a tool to destroy other nations and other communities in order to better gain power over the world and thereby establish their national identity on a global scale. Similarly, contradic similarly contradictory is the imagined bond among Jews. Some claim the bond among Jews to be a biological one, analogous to nationhood for others, but even stronger. Hitler, for example, claimed that the Jews watch over the purity of their Jewish blood much more than other people. The other position is that the bond among Jews is mediated and motivated by pure material interests. This means to help each other getting the most from a sense of belonging is the claim that Jews do not share the same bond as all other. It explains the content of this aspect of the anti-Semitic image of the other, of the Jew. It explains the answers an anti-Semite gives. What it does not explain, though, is what questions he raises and where he links them to reality. To understand where anti-Semite starts, where anti-Semite start, other issues have to be taken into account. What needs to be processed on an individual level and as a society? when people project one part of being a citizen, the bourgeois side, onto a perceived outer group. To put the question differently, understanding anti-Semitism as a constant symptom of modern society, what does it tell us about the society and the position of the subject and its ways of processing its status as bourgeois and as citoyen, especially concerning national identity? What promise lies within this identity that anti-Semites implicitly judged not to be fulfilled, to fulfill, blame the Jews for this failure. These questions are yet to be answered, and I will try to do my bit through my upcoming doctoral research. To conclude, the anti-Semitic anti image of the Jew produces a counter-image to what the omnational identity is wished to be, that also produces an ultimate enemy responsible for all national failure. The Jews are also seen as an anti-national entity questioning the national principle as well as and contradictory to the image of having the strongest bond of all nations. Additionally, the Jews are perceived to be the embodiment and representative of the bourgeois side. That is the common ground of different versions of modern anti-Semitism. The question yet to be answered is what the material basis for the principal gap of citoyen and bourgeois is and what fundamental threat is posed to anti-Semitic citizens with a firm national identity when they see others to follow their bourgeois side on him. I'll go back to what she was saying, because a lot of stuff that we had to cut to try and make our essay fit into 20 minutes was kind of covered by her, so fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Sharon, this is my sister. I mean, I, this is my sister Sharon, I'm not I'm, <laughs> I don't know my own name, but it's in the program. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm just going to start writing this. Yeah. With the idealization and proliferation of the secular Christian nation state in Europe in the modern era, power and legitimacy for the first time seem to flow up from the people. The normative idea that a people should be self governing, that in fact any other form of political organization was inherently unenlightened and oppressive informed the new delineation of states, borders, and sovereignty. Membership in a people 
one's personal sense of collective identity became of crucial political importance. One people, one nation became the rule. Thus arose the Jewish question, a consideration of what the presence of the Jews meant for the modern conception of nationhood. The idea of the Israelites representing a distinct people became a key problematic of modernity as the universalism of enlightened thinking was transformed by 19th century socialist thinkers, Jewish difference, and we're referring to that collective difference, um, remains a central problematic. It means anathema to the socialist project, this time preventing the realization of the international socialist collective rather than of the liberal democratic nation state. Socialists see the coming post-capitalist era as, by definition, a post-Jewish era. Thus, Jewish and non-Jewish post-Enlightenment thinkers from Voltaire to Hegel to Marx realized that the new, modern forms of political organization could be, and perhaps needed to be, articulated through resolution of the Jewish question. Now, inverting our perspective from the majority to the minority group, we can see how the Enlightenment brought with it for the Jews what we might call the modern question. The implicit question of modernity was an existential ultimatum. Are you one of us? <laughs> a legitimate member of the people of a given nation states or international collective, which is by definition non-Jewish? Or are you a separate people, an alien presence on the body of the nation? Jews have responded to this ultimatum in various ways, but two strong and conflicting answers were to emerge. The first response is the affirmation and reframing of Jewish difference, which came to be expressed as Zionism. In an era when all rights flow from peoplehood and citizenship in a nation, one way for Jews to access those rights is by asserting the dif this, their difference, breaking off from the nations in which they live, and demanding equal rights as a separate people. This response led eventually to the founding of the modern Jewish nation state, Israel. The second response, which is the focus of our presentation today, is the negation of Jewish difference, which we classify as an assimilationist response. The new nation state model held out the inherent promise of equality to Jews since citizenship rights were granted to all simply by virtue of one's belonging to the people. The secularizing impulse of modernity also meant that religious difference became privatized and ostensibly depoliticized. Under these conditions, Judaism could be tolerated as long as it was exclusively a personal faith. Thus, as a logical part of their assimilationist strategy to obtain equal civil rights, Jewish reformers and masculine worked to reformulate Jewishness into exclusively an expression of personal faith with absolutely no national or political affiliation. As we shall see, the major Jewish assimilationist responses to modernity, from the Enlightenment's liberal and reformist responses, through to 20th century socialism, universalism, and anti-Zionism, are driven by this impulse to deny any Jewish difference and Jewish collectivity. It is crucial here that we define our use of the term assimilationist as a central element of the analytical framework we are proposing. Some scholars use assimilationism in a way which might more accurately be termed adaptationism, the impulse of Jews to divest themselves of particular signs of difference in order to adapt to mainstream society. For our purposes, assimilationism is not merely a passive ad adoption by Jews of non-Jewish cultural, linguistic or national identity markers, but rather an active ideological compulsion toward the eradication of Jewish difference. Thus, one might be a highly assimilated Jew, but not necessarily an assimilationist within this framework. The unending need to identify, vilify, and ultimately negate Jewish difference is the key distinguishing marker of assimilationism as an active, politically salient ideology. These two primary orientations, the one Zionist, the other assimilationist, characterize the ongoing Jewish response to the modern question. They are also perceived, particularly by assimilationists, as existentially threatening to one another. If Jews do indeed share some sort of national and therefore political association, how can they rightly demand access to belonging and its attendant civic rights in another nation or international collective? The question of Jewish dual loyalties persists to this day, although the language may have shifted from conflicting Jewish loyalty to conflicting Zionist loyalty. The assimilationist response, in its purest expression, has remained profoundly hostile to Zionism as an expression of Jewish difference, as it must indeed be hostile to any expression of Jewish difference. By tracing the major strategies that Jewish post-Enlightenment thinkers utilized in their quest for political emancipation, 
we can gain a broader understanding of the connections between early assimilationist responses to the modern question and contemporary Jewish and science thought. The rest of our presentation outlines the major types of Jewish assimilation strategies, which we've divided into three categories. The first is political apostasy, the personal renunciation and emphatic negation of Jewish peoplehood. The second is the modernization of religious Judaism, so as to make it represent enlightenment values. And the third is the strategy of positioning himself as the good Jew in the good Jew, bad Jew dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the first strategy, and this is political apostasy. <coughs> political apostasy eventually came to replace religious apostasy as a means for Jewish assimilation and emancipation. In the secularized modern world, a world where religious affiliation has ostensibly been subordinated to the political, the source of Jewish difference was recentered onto the political as well. Whereas in the medieval era, conversion to Christianity theoretically allowed Jews to neutralize Jewish difference, promising an end to religious persecution, political apostasy carries with it a promise to end Jewish political persecution. All one has to do is reject one's political difference to the emphatic negation of Jewish peoplehood. This can be really seen, for example, in the uh, statement to Napoleon made by the Assembly of Jewish Nobles uh, in 18th century France that uh, Suzette talked about, which stated, here's a quote, um, France is our country, all Frenchmen are our brethren. It stated, at the present time, when the Jews no longer form a separate people, but enjoy the advantage of being incorporated with the great nation, which privilege they consider as a kind of political redemption, it is impossible that a Jew should treat should treat a Frenchman not of his religion in any other manner than he would treat one of his Israelite brethren. And similar statements of political apostasy can be found throughout the Western European debates on the Jewish question, in which many enlightened Jews hasten to claim their rights as emancipated citizens of the states in which they lived by denying any separate national or political claims as Jews. Another aspect of political apostasy is the defense of Judaism as exclusively religious in nature. This became a core tenet of the radical reform Judaism movement of the 19th century Germany and America. For example, at the uh, Second Reform Rabbinical Conference at Frankfurt in 1845, uh, where the president of the conference actually charged speakers to, quote, beware of creating any doubt concerning their allegiance to the state. Uh, one speaker, Rabbi Samuel Holheim, saw Zionism as contradicting German Jews' patriotic feeling for their fatherland. He asserted, quote, our nationality is now only expressed in religious concepts and institutions, and he cautioned that with respect to Judaism in Germany, one must not mistake a national for a religious phenomenon, otherwise many abuses could be justified. The same strain carried through the radical reform movement in America, for example, into the late 19th and 20th centuries, so we can see in organizations like the American Council for Judaism. Um, and an ex one example uh, is that in the platform of the, rabbinical, of the Reform Rabbinical Conference in Pittsburgh, which became the basic statement of Reform Judaism from 1889 until 1937, there's a principle in this um, statement that rejects Zionism and any restoration of laws formally pertaining to the Jewish state on the premise that, quote, we consider ourselves no longer a nation but a religious community. For socialist and universalist Jewish thinkers who reject nationalism on the basis of enlightenment universalist values, the same impulse has led them to advocate political assimilation into an implicitly non-Jewish international proletariat. The important impulse to note here is not the type of collective into which the Jew is uh, assimilating, but rather the Jewish collective which is being negated in the process. Marx, being one of the earliest post-Jewish internationalists and certainly most influential, adapted the assimilation strategy to international socialism. When religious conversion proved insufficient to convince his fellow thinkers that he was not a Jew, Marx seemed compelled to negate his own Jewishness by promoting an end to all Jews as Jews everywhere. His famous statement, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of mankind from Judaism, can be read as a personal secular declaration of apostasy from political Jewishness, as well as a statement of orthodox international socialist dogma. Universalist Jewish thinkers throughout the 20th century have echoed Marx's political apostasy, asserting, as did Marx, that the disavowal of Jewish difference is the first necessary step in the eradication of all political difference. Isaac Deutscher, who coined the term non-Jewish Jew in a lecture given to the World Jewish Congress in 1958, deeply admired those Jews who had in his view risen above Jewishness to approach the greatness of universal human values. For Deutscher, 
Jews such as Spinoza, Heine, Marx, Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, Freud, and himself belong to a Jewish tradition of dissent against Jewish separateness. Deutscher said that these non-Jewish Jews, quote, went beyond the boundaries of Jewry. They all found Jewry too narrow, too archaic, and too constricting. They all look for ideals and fulfillment beyond it, and they represent the sum and substance of much that is greatest in modern thought. So a second related assimilation strategy is to reform, reformulate and represent Judaism as a thoroughly modern faith, an expression of the political, cultural, and ethical ideals of the Enlightenment. For reformist Jews and for secular universalist Jewish thinker, thinkers, Judaism needed to be expunged of any threatening non-Enlightenment aspects, particularly tribalism, separatism, and exceptionalism. Some 19th century Jewish thinkers, such as Martin Luther, while remaining committed to some form of Jewish spiritual and even national, perhaps, collectivity, nonetheless set about modernizing Jewishness by arguing that Judaism itself, properly realized, was actually the truest expression of universal enlightenment values of rationality, justice, and individual freedom. We can see Deutscher using the strategy in the aforementioned quote about non-Jewish Jews. Deutscher believes that Jews' unique positioning on the borderlines of nations and cultures grants them special access to universalist values which reject as oppressive the very existence of different nations, cultures, and religions. Building on the work of earlier Enlightenment Jewish thinkers who modernized Judaism in this way, contemporary Jewish anti-Zionist post-identity thinkers have thoroughly modernized Judaism and stripped it of all notion of separate collectivity. Judith Butler's Jewishness conforms to this model. When she asks the question, quote, but what if one criticizes Israel in the name of one's Jewishness, in the name of justice? Jewishness in this quote becomes synonymous with justice. And for Butler, whose body of work has been dedicated to self-proclaiming subversive activist politics, Jewishness becomes synonymous with dissent. She writes that it is wrong, quote, to suppose that criticism is not a Jewish value which clearly flies in the face not only of long traditions of Talmudic disputation, but of all the religious and cultural sources that have been part of Jewish life for centuries. In so doing, she decontextualizes the Jewish tradition of oral dispute dispute such that the entirety of Judaism itself becomes, in practice, this disputation, read dissent. It is this decontextualized practice of Jewish dissent, emblematic of certain enlightenment values, which becomes, for universalist Jews, the true Judaism, in which they clearly see themselves, but not Zionist Jews, reflected. And the third major tool used by assimilationists seeks to allow a certain subset of Jews to gain access to non-Jewish national or international belonging by insisting on differentiation between the good Jew and the bad Jew. When used as an assimilation strategy, the good Jew is that Jew who has been stripped of any and all threatening signs of Jewish difference, which are displaced onto the bad Jews. The good Jew, compared to those bad Jews who insist on Jewish separateness, using them as a foil to prove their own successful assimilation into the non-Jewish collective. This strategy is necessary because of the double line that Samuel Gilman identified. The Enlightenment held up the promise of emancipation if only Jews would disavow their difference, and yet at the same time this promise proved to be false. A Jew somehow always remains a Jew, different, foreign, no matter how strenuously they may protest otherwise. The next logical move is to claim that, well, I may be Jewish, but at least I'm not like those Jews. Unable to de-Judaize themselves through political apostasy and secularization, these non-Jewish Jews, whose Deutsch's terminology, have typically fallen back on the strategy of loudly and even mindedly distancing themselves from other Jews, whom they represent as those Jewish allied Jews, the bad Jews. Since the Enlightenment in Western Europe as well as in America, there's often been the Eastern Jew, stereotyped as religious, poor, backwards, who serves the bad Jew in this dichotomy. In Germany, the masculine sought to differentiate themselves from the religious and backwards Eastern European Jews. While in France and Holland, Sephardi fought for emancipation on the grounds that in dress, refinement, morality, and intellect, they were completely unlike and superior to the German and Polish Hashemazim, who were largely viewed as unmodern and external to the nation. In the latter half of the 20th century, Jewish anti Zionist thought has also emerged to rely heavily on the Gucci Bachi strategy, where in this case, the bad Jews are the backwards, tribally oriented Zionists. While the good Jews are those enlightened few who have moved beyond Judaism to join the universal movement against Israeli state power. All contemporary Jewish anti Zionist thinkers emphasize that the Jewish community can be divided into two groups the Zionist majority and the oppressed anti Zionist minority. 
They stress that the main strategy of the Jewish anti-Zionist movement must be, in Butler's words, to widen the rift between the state of Israel and the Jewish people in order to produce an alternate vision of the future. Much like how some of those assimilationist Jews who used this strategy in centuries past tacitly or even overtly justify discrimination and hatred of certain bad Jews, so too do contemporary anti-Zionists justify and even advocate anti-Semitism against Zionist Jews. Indeed, one of the primary arguments of Jewish anti-Zionist thought is that Zionism is the main cause of anti-Semitism in the world today due to its conflation of Jews with Israel and its commission of evil acts in the name of all Jews. As the centuries pass, the assimilationist assertion is that Jews who want to get rid of anti-Semitism need to disavow Jewish difference and issue those Jews who refuse to do so. Thus, Jews who refuse to reject Zionism should expect and deserve anti-Semitism directed towards them. Um, because of time, I'm going to skip. I have two examples here, but I'm going to skip to the second example, um, which is Michael Newman's quite shocking essay, which he called, What is Anti-Semitism? And in this essay, you may have read it, <laughs> Um, we're informed that due to the Zionist conflation of Jews and Zionism, since anti-Zionism is just and good, anti-Semitism should also be seen as just and good. He argues that if Zionists insist on labeling as anti-Semitic any opposition against Israel and against any Jew who is complicit in Israeli war crimes by refusing to denounce Israel, then both anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism must be, as he puts it, a moral obligation. Besides, and he continues, of course, anti-Semitism isn't that bad. Quote, simple hostility towards Jews and Jewish culture is harmless. And anyway, those Jews who refuse to renounce Zionism and Jewish tribalism, which he characterizes as racism, pure and simple, the value of one's blood over all others, they deserve whatever they get. His final sentences are especially revealing in their analysis and they're worth repeating. He says, quote, the scandal today is not anti-Semitism, but the importance is given. Israel has committed war crimes. It has implicated Jews generally in these crimes and Jews generally have hastened to implicate themselves. This has provoked hatred against Jews. Why not? Some of this hatred is racist, some isn't, but who cares? Why should we pay any attention to this issue at all? In Newman's essay, and in numerous other examples throughout the history of Zionist thought, we can see how the Jewish assimilation strategy, which seeks to deny all Jewish difference and allegiance, can and does lead in a reasonable and not unexpected way to the phenomenon of some Jews actively promoting anti-Semitism against their fellow Jews. This is what we do. Again, that the impulse to eradicate Jewish difference, be it from a national or international collective, is qualitatively anti-Jewish, both in intent and effect. If a Jew feels the need to neutralize Jewish difference, he or she has already internalized the anti-Semitic belief that Jewish difference is inherently threatening. While universalists like Butler or Deutscher may claim that their vocation as quote non-Jewish Jews is somehow positive and, pro and progressively working toward the subversion of hegemonic nationalisms, their logic is inconsistent since the neutralization or eradication of Jewish Jews can only serve to reinforce nationalism's at times gen genocidal xenophobic tendencies. Of course, there is an important space for dissent and negotiation in the global Jewish community. But if one values Judaism and Jews, one must also guard against impulses which are ultimately anti-Jewish. It is crucially important to distinguish between those Jewish, Jewish voices who argue for an expansion of the theoretical and practical boundaries of belonging by insisting on their belonging in more than one nation, Jewish and American, for example, who assert their identity as both those things, and those who are working from a point of view which views Jewish difference as a problem which can only be overcome with acceleration. Jews and therefore 
it's illegitimate. So my question is, when you talk about modern anti-Semitism and national identity, is modern mean current, or does modern mean pre-World War II? Um, modern anti-Semitism. Yeah. I, I, um, first of all, I um, argue for a, um, a concept of anti-Semitism that um, understands the Jew hatred um, in its um, racial and political form. Now it has merged with a more culturalist form, but the content is still the same. Uh, as I said, from the mid uh, 18th to the mid 19th century. I don't think there's a major difference um, in terms of the content of the anti Semitism before Auschwitz and after Auschwitz. Of course, there are different phenomena like secondary anti Semitism in Germany. There, of course, is a, um, 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 uh, a way to deal um, with national socialism in. Uh, German national identity, so obviously it kind of uh, been on, on the political stage before. But what, what it does uh, do is to um, show an anti Semitism in a different form, but content is still the same. So that was your second question. Your first question um, I think it, uh, I disagree that, I, I, I presume you, you um, refer to the left when yes. you stated. Uh, people against nationalism. Um, actually, no, they're not against nationalism. I, um, I, I, I agree on that. I disagree on that point. Um, they might be, as we discussed in the earlier panel, for a reformed um, understanding of national identity. Uh, they might have a disagreement in terms of what should be um, the um, criteria for who's taking part in national identity on and on which grounds. Um, but believe me, I am part of the left, and uh, when I make a statement um, that is critical towards national identification, I have 99% of, of the rest uh, against me. Uh, so I would argue that, um, sure enough, they have a lot against Zionism, and uh, sure enough, uh, most are anti-Zionist and um, most, and that, that includes for most being anti-Semitic, but I think one should have a closer look at their, of their understanding of national identification, and I think that um, was also um, um, presented on this conference uh, a couple of times when the connection to anti-imperialism was reflected, and in there you can see how it is not about abolishing national but rather, as you also had in your uh, statement, the idea that each people should have one nation and it's about the oppressed and whoever's seen as the oppressed is the one that left fights for. But that's a very different position than to say they have something against national identification or national in general. But, uh, you know, you had to expand on, on the terminology. I'm sure we have to use it a little differently. Well, the European we left. Like, should, should we have, like, the other people wanting to say something and then if we have time left, we can... Um, I would say that they say Zionism is considered to be the most Jewish when I have read that it was found on secular principles that Theodor Herzl himself was condemned by the Jews who were observant. I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Perhaps there are people um, here who have done presentations more specifically on Zionism <laughs> that might be able to, to more how is how is it people can say Zionism was is having to do with the Jewish religion when in fact when Theodore Herzl used it he was basing on more secular principles. That's true. But, then, but I'm not sure that we were discussing Zionism as a religious form of Jewishness. I think well, anti Zionism was a way with anti Semitism. Well, then, it just comes into a discussion of how you just define Jewishness, and that's absolutely okay. Right. So, yeah, it's got a conflict. It doesn't seem to be responding to our views. No, it's just a short of government. Zionism was secular, true, but Judaism is also a religious identity. You cannot be a non Jewish Jew, you cannot be a Christian Jew. If it, a, a secular Jew is also a Christian by religion, you could not be. 
and the, the link to the land of Israel was always that some mystical religious element. And this is, for instance, you can see it in the rejection of the of Uganda idea. Mm -hmm. And Herzl had proposed Uganda as a temporary solution to the Jews. Do not resonate. Socialist Jews <laughs> were against it because they had said that there was the mystical religious link to the land of Israel. So there was always this uh, element. But if I could make a comment on this uh, national, post nationalism era, which I agree with you, there is European, there is supposedly non nationalism in Europe. There is, there is European nationalism. It supposedly replaces the more, uh, the narrower French, German, uh, or Greek nationalism. But there is supposedly European nationalism, which is very much anti American, anti Israel. What makes European nationalism is being against America. So, the sense that supposedly Europe is about nationalism is, uh, I think, more a slogan than a uh, reality because European identity is built on a collective identity also, and if it's not very scientific, you look at the World Cup, <laughs> and the fact that people painted their face with the national flag shows that they did feel Germans cheer the German team and not cheer the other team that defeated Germany either when they were supposedly above nationalism. That first of all is the empirical side that you can see that the, the European national identity or whatever you want to call it um, doesn't seem to uh, uh, most people don't necessarily agree or feel that as their first identity. But on a more general uh, point that you were sitting at the beginning, I think there's no um, fundamental difference. Um, I don't think in the way the European identity would be bigger. There's any difference toward the national identity. You also have a sort of a form of a state in there, the international uh, cooperation in the EU is by far the most reaching as sovereign uh, parts of the state had, has been given, have been given over to um, an, um, an institution above the state. And also, there, there is a possibility in that that people identify with that body, with that understanding of the community. But I don't think it has a major change to what national identity is about. It's just a little bigger. Uh, I have a question to the uh, power system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people call me that. Uh, we prefer to be known as the powers that be. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was. Um, Can you please tell me it's part of a larger project, what is the larger project, or this is just the, the first time that you spoke to one another uh, to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this was, this was my form of procrastinating writing my thesis this summer, uh -huh. this entire exercise. Um, but we have like a larger paper from which we had to cut to get this 20 minute thing. We wrote it for this conference. We wrote it for this conference. But is it part of your no. I, I, I write on liberal multicultural theory, and, and I write on the Yiddish theater. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Wait, what is that? you write on? Liberal multicultural theory. She's a political theorist, I'm a historian. So. Um, and the two come together, and it's pure genius. Uh, actually, I think it is a uh, 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 very, very productive cooperation, and I think that. Um, uh, your parents have done a better job than I do. Well, that's, that's a big match. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, fully, we fully intend to submit it. To your parents? Yeah. No, but to, 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 to Germany, anyone who would want to publish it would like it. It sounds really fascinating. There's the great questions. Oh, there was a question. binary 
exclusive and identification processes, um, I think, at the bottom, at the total bottom of anti-Semitism. And um, at that point, it's actually um, not really the question if it's the European Union that comes first, or if it's first at that time um, the, the, the subnation of you know, the region, but the problem is the identification process. Um. I do think it's not by chance that it has a kind of exclusiveness. Right. It is only referring to a certain identity, and that is the identity with its own nation and state. I mean, each person has sexual identities, a thousand other identities, so it's not exclusive in that sense, but only in the sense of what um, state body one refers to. And I think it is exclusive because, um, well, there are some people with two or more passports, but in general, you have one passport, and that means you're a subject of that specific state. That is where the, where the exclusiveness comes from. So I, so I would say the identity is not by chance uh, corresponding to the way the world is organized today. And I don't think that this is what you have in, in the concept of national liberation. It is just another nationalism, but that is that corresponds to a, a state yet to be established want to establish. So that's the same thing with the owner. I don't think there's a big difference. It is either people feel that we had a debate before, either people identify with a certain Arab nation, or they, they go further and say, oh, there, there should be uh, this and that nation. But that is not different to Kurdish nationalists who say uh, we should have that state or the state identity or whatever um, with, with another content, obviously. But they have that identification too, as people have or have a state. I would like to make two remarks. One is on the last point that you said, and the other thing is about the connection between nation and state. Because I think that uh, until the nation state exists, the concept is the nation, the identification. And it's still not overcome um, the nation concept with um, change for European identity, I would argue. In every conflict which is happening in the European Union, you, you've seen in the last, I don't know, during the financial crisis, that the strong revival of national identity. In the moment, there is a conflict between the different competing nation states in the European Union. If it's related to Greece, to Greece, um, the crisis in Greece, or differences between the Germans and France, uh, the French, and so on. So I would argue it's, there, there is not the, the, the European identity still not, it's far from being an important identity. Until now it's the, the national identity and it's related to the nation state and the forms of regulation uh, of this very society we're living in. But looking into the foundations, I'm sorry, but it, it's very important, this supposed European identity when it comes to international relations and we're just to the flotilla identity. Yeah, you can see, but for example, you can see. <laughs> I think we need a separate panel on European identity. Um, and if you see a boycott of Iran, you can see they're very clear. There's a distinction between German capital interests and French capital interests, yeah. for example. So there is no conflict. And to come to the UMA, I, I would argue there is a difference between the nation concept and the Islamic UMA uh, seen by Islamists. Because Islamic Umar is the a religious concept, which is not, it's not the territory or the population is, is not exclusive. Everybody in the future should be a Muslim. That's the difference. It's a, it's a political idea too. Yeah, it's political, but it's not like exclusive as the nation state concept is. The nation all the time is you are in this nation, and the nation in contrast to religion uh, it's, it's not that every every member of the world or every individual of the world gets uh, German or gets French or gets US American. Well, but the Islamic Uma wants that everybody is part of the Islamic Uma. They, they do fantasize about a political uh, uber state. Well, if I could, I think that there is an interesting thing that we had to gloss over was one of those sections that got cut a little bit, but I mentioned it. Um, there is something about democracy which, again, it's different from a, a religious concept of, of subject to, if you are all subject to the umma, then, then power, similar to like pre-modern um, political arrangements, power is flowing down, right? Like it flows from God down. God gives God's laws, and 
you know, in whatever medieval times, you've had God appoints his sovereign, who then is sovereign over everyone, right? As opposed to a democratic nation state, power is coming from the reverse direction, right? So, um, surely there is an absolute difference there. They're both political arrangements, but there's a difference perhaps in, in consequence. There, one could theoretically see a way for um, that, that downward, that power coming from, from above situation is allowing for a certain amount of um, tolerance from above in a way that, that the purely democratic arrangement, one looks like, I think you'd like to talk Bill's writing on the dangers of absolute democracy here. When, when it's coming from below, one might get into, to, one can see how that leads to a different situation. It doesn't speak to it, but I just say that this is how the, the both the, the Uma can be both. It's a political arrangement, but but it is um, um, theoretically and in practice a very different organization of power in society. But it is an organization of power in society, therefore political. But you've been wanting to say something for a while, and then we'll come back. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm joining all of this music. But I, I wanted to see if I understood what you were saying about modernization, because. Um, had problems with what you know, there are women, all women standing up. Um, I, I mean, were you saying that modernization leads to anti Semitism? No, 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 no. You know, you, went, you talked about Reform Judaism and you stopped at 1930 something. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, but if you go, because I, I thought something was missing. It's, it's when we read, especially um, as certain Jewish thinkers that were categorizing as. Right. Sure. Sure. And will yeah. will will literally um, make the idea like all Judaism is absolutely synonymous with justice or individual yeah, freedom. I understand the Judith Butler, but, but the, like, get away from her because that's oh. all I <laughs> No, I want to talk. You know, well, like the way she so reads. Let me, let me ask her what you're saying about Reform Judaism. We're, we're we were looking at its, its <laughs> historical origins. I mean, the Reform Judaism split off in 1937 because of the Zionist question. That's why the yeah. But then what happened after that? Like the American the, Council for Judaism came. The anti-Zionists continued. There is still a radical reform Jewish movement. But 1967 is really was the turning point of Reform Judaism, which was Reform Judaism was the first movement in this country to really accept. So, you know, you, have, you can't stop at, no, you know, you're we, talking we, modernism. You couldn't classify anything absolute in that way. When we're talking mm -hmm. about general trends that, I mean, everything is in balance, right? From Judaism now is, is walking a careful line. It's deeply shifted from its roots. I mean, right. the roots of German. Yeah, so, now, so I'm just trying to understand what you, what but that was an example of. Well, what in your ideological in your roots, and when the ideological roots of this assimilationist ideology, which you can, you can, I know it's because we have yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of the original, like the assembly of, of reformed Jews and talking when they were coming up with yeah, what yeah. it means to be a Jew under yeah. reform. But the reform with a capital R, reform Judaism, of course, yeah. has, has so I think you have to be transformed. Careful. I think you have to be careful because if you have something more to say, but it can get lost in ideology. Well, I think that the fact that reform Judaism is still called reform Judaism makes it difficult in the, to differentiate from reformers who are doing what we're talking about yeah. and reform Jews today who obviously there's a variety some would count as what we're calling this in life again and there are well, in the essay in the essay we do refer to it as radical reform i would never say just reform this is a radical reform movement originally there was just reform aren't we all assimilated in some way we're not talking about again did you, this was yeah. this was sorry this is the main yeah. point which we can go over again between we're not saying assimilated we're saying we're talking about assimilationism yeah. as an actually politically salient ideology. And assimilationism is, uh, as we characterize it, this sort of compulsion to eradicate all Jewish difference. I think you saw the ladies probably basically saying that we're talking about the reform at a particular point in time. Reform Judaism has changed dramatically and it's quite different today. Can just leave it Sure, but of course yeah. the, it, the strain that, that was then is Continuing today, so there is a, yeah, yeah, there is not like a here, an absolute hard to hard to find. Can I get back to Hilda's yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> statement? Go with the nationalism. Thank you. Well, and now I'm in when I publish things. It's, you know, sometimes.
sometimes it drops a lot, like the interest rate drops a lot. It's a whole difference I would like to get back to the Lucas paper because I have difficulty. Uh, it does not, in my opinion, describe today's anti-Semitism in Europe, which is becoming rampant. It's becoming uh, viral, and uh, it is primarily identified on the European left, from Britain to France to Germany to Italy, across Europe, across Western Europe, not uh, uh, Central Europe or, or Eastern Europe. And I would like to understand why is anti-Semitism in Europe on the left? And why is there no equivalent, if your theory is correct about nationalism, uh, viral anti-Islamism in Europe? There is only viral anti-Semitism in Europe. Why? I think the analysis I do is has exactly the other the other way. It's not exactly the other way around. I'm not trying to answer why a certain wrong explanation of the world. Uh, competes over another. What I have is uh, the facts you, sh you started with, and that are also the starting point for, for any local anti antisemitism. It, it, it is on the rise. So, and then going back, how does that, how do people relate their anti Semitic analysis, their anti Semitic arguments? What does that reflect of reality? Where, where does it uh, uh, link to reality, and where do they get it wrong? This is the attempt I've been trying to make. So I'm not sure if you got something wrong because you sound like you want to explain to me and sometimes on the rise, but this is something we totally agree on. On the second point, that it's only on the left, I disagree because, for example, this is not like all the data obviously that needs to be discussed, but just to give you an example, in Germany in the past 10 years, each single of the five main parties have had their anti-Semitic scandal, and it was astonishingly similar the way it was dealt with. Um, from the left to the right, there was a single person and some, uh, uh, either with a mandate or with others, some, some figure in the party that meant something, not just a member, who openly expressed anti-Semitism in one way or another. Uh, the party first tried to ignore it. When it did become a, a kind of um, a scandal, um, the media and, and some activists trying to make a scandal out of it, um, uh, the party tried to minimize it uh, and tried not to uh, uh, try to declare that it is not anti-Semitism. And then, uh, very slowly, as it was clear that this couldn't be sort of kept in the box, um, uh, tried to. I don't know, take some minimal actions. One of the problems was solved uh, by suicide, and the other problem was solved by expulsion. Uh, so you had the first varieties of, of how to work out, but the way those parties from the right to the left to deal with anti Semitism, at least in Germany, uh, is quite similar. And what, what I think is that what, 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 what I think the, the left actually does is that it expresses its uh, anti Semitism. Um, in form of uh, anti-Zionism much more openly, but, but I disagree with the tendency that has also been quite present on this conference, that it is the sole problem of Islamists and of left-wing activists. And this is what also my paper tried to uh, uh, substantiate, because the argument I'm trying to make is that it links to national identity, and that obviously is an issue of left and right. Um, uh, Oh, yeah. I think one, one, one difference is maybe because the left is acting on the street, this is also mm -hmm. the migrant organizations sometimes. You mean it's more visible? It's more visible mm -hmm. because the, in, in the okay, regular population, if, if you know the different um, parts of the society, you know where you can find the strongest anti-Semites, and they are on the right and not on the left. You can, in Germany, for example, you know where to go to find people saying, okay, I want the, the Jews go back to the gas chambers and so on. But it's the right, it's clearly the right, the radical right, conservative views. They're not from the left. So, and, and, and I think you also use Germany as an example. Okay, and I find that that a problem. Spain. Uh, take Spain, take France, yeah, Spain. Uh, and, and uh, 
Tell me uh, where the anti-Semitism is coming from. In Spain, you can differentiate five different groups in the population. Those with the, the strong Catholic backgrounds, their anti-Semites, view their Catholicism, and some music. Then you, you got the, 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 the anti-global left and so on. So they are those who already know. Then you got the post-Frankism right and the conservative uh, people and so on. It's feature between they are all also anti-science strongly. It's not like the PP is going uh, to with Asna and to, to go in front of the regular of the ground. Um, of, of this part of the population, they are against Israel, they are against Jews, and we can find on the conservative uh, right wing, we can find this uh, uh, um, anti Jewish uh, hatred based on religion, on national identity, and conspiracy theories, and also anti Israel hatred. So, but they are those who are in the streets. That's true. Well, I'm but, but I'm saying, to answer your question, to answer your question a very short attempt at this big question. Um, the first one, I'm not as confident in, in uh, other figures um, that got out of my head, but I think in each country you had, um, what do you say, uh, uh, inquiries, um, polls yeah. being done, and they also asked for anti-Semitic uh, prejudice as well as party affiliation. And you, can, you have relevant differences, and you can look at uh, what, what it matters that people are on the right or left or whatever. And that varies from country to country, but still, uh, I, I don't think I have seen any figure that suggests that any party is free of anti semitism And actually, um, um, yeah, you, you have a, not just one percent, but a relevant level in any country and in any party. Second question on, well, uh, why don't we explain anti semitism to me? This is the one pillar that I think uh, is important for modern anti semitism the identification of the nation and the projection of this bourgeois side uh, onto the Jew. And the second question concerns the economic side, uh, which also plays in with that, obviously, the, because the bourgeois side, the self-interest side, is uh, one of the most about the uh, economic side. And I think it is the projection um, of um, any uh, parts of modernity or capitalism perceived as being negative onto the Jews. I think those two pillars, anything that is perceived the nation state and of the uh, of, of, um, market economy um, um, is seen in the Jew. And that is the basic of any modern anti Semitism. I think that is, the, the, those are the brackets. And then you have varieties in secondary anti Semitism or other forms, but this is something that I see in any anti Semitism. I think that so I think is missing here. Hang on, so from the panel Well, and perhaps what's so interesting is that um, what you're talking about might be at work regardless of the person's conscious yes. political affirmation. So I can scream, I'm an anti-nationalist, I'm an anti-nationalist, but in practice, I'm quite clearly nationally identified, even if I think that nations shouldn't, shouldn't be the basis of political world order, I'm still, I'm still going to identify as fill in the blank cultural identity, because you could be. You could, we, don't, we, don't, we don't quite have a way of love. you this panel has mentioned in Europe, and I think the problem is a major problem in Europe is the intellectual elite and where they come from, who are the greatest proponents of anti Israel and they send that Semitic feeling to Europe today. But they're also extremely culturally aligned. I mean, where the is French the intellectual elite? You haven't talked about it. 